Let me give a little bit more context here with these compressions because you actually taught me about compression lows because, again, I'm new to CGM technology and I didn't know that that was a thing. But when you put on a sensor, at least in the Freestyle Libre world, it's supposed to last for 14 days. Uh, in the Dexcom world, is the sensor also a 14-day sensor? Do you know? I think, I think the 7 is a 14-day. They were Okay, tens. so the G7 is a 14-day sensor. Okay. Okay, so... In theory, you put on a sensor and then the sensor should be on your body for about two weeks. And then during that two week period, it should be providing uh, consistent blood glucose readings to your phone anywhere from every two to five minutes and then give you a blood glucose profile. So that that should be in theory what it's doing, right? Um, however, um, what the compression lows that you're talking about indicate is that when you go to sleep, um, sorry, not necessarily when you go to sleep. At any moment during the day or when you are sleeping, <clears throat> if you have, if you are lying on your sensor or if your sensor is actually experiencing a mechanical compression, then it can give you a false reading. And the false reading, I think, is oftentimes a low reading. Is that is that correct, Lauren? Personally, anecdotally, yeah. It's the low reading with the compression error. And that is... Uh, Clinically, I'd like to see that in writing. I don't know if we'll be able to actually find it determined in writing that that is what happened, but I tend to go to the party of thousands of people type one that will just tell you straight up what happens when they experience it. And yeah, it's, it's, um, it's really unfair that it happens during the night when we're sleeping, when otherwise we would be practicing our healthy habits, getting a good night's sleep, which is also super important to metabolism and to glucose during the day. And instead, it's reading us as false. And what that can lead to, and this actually has happened for people that um, have to type 2 diabetes who wouldn't otherwise experience low blood sugars. And what's happening is getting up during the middle of the night, treating that low blood sugar, potentially with a panic eat, you're eating in panic. You're not eating four glucose tabs or specifically, you know, 12 to 15 grams of carbohydrate. You're panicking and you're treating something that's not happening. And that's exactly where another big blinking light of a problem is being created that wasn't already there to begin with. Yep. Okay. So you just nailed it on the head because again, it's giving you a false reading. And then if you act upon that false reading, uh, you can end up putting yourself in an even more, you know, precarious position. Okay. So the sensors only have technically, you know, like one one piece of real estate on your body. That's a, that's that's an approved location, and that is on the back of your arm. So if you look at the instruction manual for the Leo Barry Three, it'll say, "Make sure that you put the sensor right here, or sort of between your tricep and your shoulder, or right on the back of your tricep, but somewhere in the sort of like upper arm, like posterior position, right?" So if you you have basically a couple of choices right here on your left arm and a couple of choices right here on your right arm, which is fine. But here's the deal. When you go to sleep, you're sleeping when you're Cyrus and you sleep in the fetal position on the right-hand side or fetal position on the left-hand side, well, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get a compression low every single time, right? And so I sleep in three positions. I either sleep like a pencil on my back and then I end up snoring and I bother Kylie, which is not awesome. So then I turn the fetal position on the right and then boom, it triggers a compression low. Or I turn the fetal <laughs> position on the left and it triggers a compression low. And I'm like, great. Maybe I should just sleep standing up. This is ridiculous, right? So what a good friend of mine who's wearing the Freestyle Libre 2 educated me about is he said, listen, in Europe, they allow you, it is approved for you to take the sensor and actually um, place it inside of your quadriceps. So it's like, uh, you know, on the medial position inside of your quadricep, um, on the, um, toward like facing the center. And so he showed me the exact location where he puts his sensors. And he said, why don't you try this? Because then you won't get the compression low. So I placed it specifically in an area where even if I'm sleeping in fetal position and my legs are together, then it's still not going to give me a compression low on that exact location. So I started doing that. And guess what? The compression lows went away. And I was like, okay, cool. Number one, I'm injecting it. Or I'm, I'm adding the sensor. Or I'm, I'm inserting the sensor in a place where I'm not supposed to. So I hope that this gives me like a somewhat accurate reading. It's probably going to be better than what it was on my arm. And secondarily, maybe my problem is solved because I'm not getting a compression low. But then I went to the gym one day. And I go to a gym and I go to a spin class and I'm like, heart rate's elevated and everything's fantastic. And I get out of the gym class and I'm like, man, I just got a really kick butt workout and now my insulin sensitivity is sky high. Fantastic. 
So I checked my glucose at the end of the workout and it was like 77. So I ate a couple of dates. I didn't overeat and I was like, all right, cool. I'm just going to wait. I sit down in the car and low glucose alarm goes off. And I was like, huh, interesting. So I eat one or two more dates. And then two minutes later, five minutes later, low glucose alarm goes again. And I was like, that's weird. So I eat one more date. And I was like, I'm not going to overeat on these dates because I know what's going to happen. I'm going to go sky high. Though the, I got five low glucose alarms and I was like, this is weird, right? And I checked my blood glucose and my blood glucose was, my actual blood glucose meter read that my glucose was like somewhat low. It was like in the 70s or 80s. And so I was doing the right action. And then when I get home about 10 minutes later, all of a sudden my alarm goes off and I check my phone again and I see that my blood glucose profile goes from being flat, 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 flat to literally a straight line up to 191. And, I, and, and the straight line went from low glucose to high glucose within two minutes. And I was like, first of all, that is impossible. That, is, that line that it drew is literally not physiologically possible for your blood glucose to, to rise that quickly. And secondarily, I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, you know what? I think I gave myself another compression low while I was sitting in the car. For some reason, I think that the actual sensor might have been compressed in the position that I was sitting, maybe giving me another compression low. And then at that point, I was looking at my phone and I was like, I'm going to throw this thing through a window if I have to deal with any more of this frustration. I am trying to be so relaxed. I'm trying to be so chill, but this thing is driving me up a freaking wall. Have you ever had anything like that happen to you, Lauren? Two things. Okay. First of all, I cannot believe you got away with putting that on your leg because I've tried this. The Libre 3 app is too smart for that. At least this happened to me. I prefer to wear it on my stomach. I really want to keep it on my stomach because it's a safer space for me. I run into stuff. I'm clumsy and I've ripped this off on a seatbelt before. I mean, like, although the Libre 3 adhesive is much, much better than um, what the the Libre 1 and 2 were in the past. But I remember I put this on my stomach and I went to scan it to start it. And the app said, this is only approved for the back of your arm. I just, I was busted. I could, and, I, and then I wasted the sensor because it wouldn't work. So it knew. So I don't know how you got used, like got away with that. Second thing is, um, we could talk about how the body reacts from a high intensity cycling workout all day long. I could nerd out so hard on that. I'll save the space, but this is how I got obsessed with exercise. Yeah. I got so obsessed with studying endurance exercise because of teaching cycling. It just is, I, I'm obsessed with it because it's fascinating. Um, and then you see people without diabetes wearing sensors to learn what we are and you see them training so they get faster in the Tour de France and like all of that is super interesting. I would, I would find it very risky to put the sensor there on that part of the leg um, for a number of different reasons. But the way that the body recovers from a high intensity exercise is quite interesting. A few different things can happen and the cool down is kind of an art. So if you don't normally take, was it a 45 minute class or an hour class? It was a 45 minute class. Was it the kind of class that sends your heart rate up and holds your heart rate high? Or was there variability? Did your heart rate come down? Were you climbing and your heart rate came down? And then did you sprint? Was there variability or did you stay high the whole time? It was sawtooth, up, down, up, down, up, down. Okay, so you think your heart rate moved quite a bit? Heart rate definitely moved quite a bit, no question. Okay, so here's something that's really interesting. And, and if anyone wants to try to understand the function of this is, if you're new to sensor technology and you're just walking, or you are going all out and you're trying to do something like boot camp or uh, what's the other thing you do, CrossFit or cycling classes or something like that um, where your heart rate is moving around is if you wear a heart rate monitor and you're also tracking glucose data, there's some very interesting correlations between what happens with your heart rate variability and what happens on the CGM. And it's one really interesting way to help, to help coach people on why does my blood sugar do this 
at certain times of the workout or afterwards. And it's something I've really watched. So if you're on the lower end of your workout when you finish, that cool down needs to be dragged out a little bit longer. Dragging out the cool down slows down the uptake of glucose into your cell, right? Your cell is just sponging this up at like 50 times the normal rate while you're in the middle of endurance exercise. Drag out the cool down. Don't just stop. Just stopping with glucose knocking on the door, wanting to come back in, freaks out a CGM because a CGM doesn't want to have to work hard. That's when they're most accurate. Variability on a CGM, it wants to stay right here. Time in range between 120 and 150 or lower, right? If it's just swimming and rolling in range, we have more accuracy on the sensor. When the sensor has to think hard, our body is reacting to something. You're putting dates in, but you also stopped exercising like that. Unless you did have a 10-minute cool down, then we're going to have to go backtrack a little bit. But if you stop like that, there's this There's this pocket where your CGM doesn't know what's up. It's alarming you. So maybe you had a combination of a compression low, but you also had physiology still kind of trying to figure out, are we still going or are we still stopped? Where was your heart rate? What was actually happening here? So if we drag things out with the cool down, so you're dropping your heart rate at a little bit more of a a predictable rate coming down quite quite nicely, you maybe would have seen that 70 turn into an 80 and 85 and 90, and it would have slowly risen right back up without having to treat it with the dates. And instead, things like this can happen where I make flashcards when I work with athletes like, oh, did you see this? Let's explain how that right here didn't actually happen. (laughs) So that's the fun with CGNs and exercise, right? But there's always an explanation and and I know it can be kind of nasty, but... This is this is fascinating, actually, um, because I know exactly what you're talking about, which is that in the post-exercise state, especially when there's like a catecholamine dump from your adrenal gland, that your glucose can do very strange things. So I'm like, I, I'm glad you're bringing this up, but what you're doing is you're you're layering another a, another technology on top of it. So it would be one thing if you were using a blood glucose meter to see what's happening every five minutes, but now you're taking another you're taking a CGM that has unto itself some inaccuracies as we already described. And now you're using that as your readout. So your blood glucose can rapidly change during exercise and after exercise. And then when you have a device that's trying to tell you what's happening while it is experiencing potentially rapid glucose changes in concentration, now all of a sudden you have yourself a grand old quagmire and you're like, you know what? I don't even know what I'm supposed to do right now, but those dates taste awfully tasty. So I'm just going to continue to eat them. (laughs) (laughs) Especially when you're done with an aggressive exercise, your body's craving a number of different things. And that's actually, I think with, with Kylie too, like having the non num like not having to watch this happen, she's watching you react versus watching the numbers happen is living by the numbers and how much that directs our attitude. It directs us and reactivity is a big word in life with diabetes. Reactivity is something to be careful with. The sensor causes some reactivity. So being able to sit back and analyze a situation before we just go, "Mm, dates, (laughs) even though it might be the right decision. Reactivity. And I I know that cyclists, they'll take their glucose monitor or their CGM or when we had two different devices where we could see our CGM data and our phone is they basically tape it to their handlebars so they can see what their blood is doing every second, which may or may not actually be helpful because you got to listen to you. What kind of decisions did you make? When is the last time you ate? When is the last time you injected insulin? These are the things that are so vital, whether you're testing your finger or you're trusting the sensor. One way or another, we have to have some safety checks, checkpoints. And yeah. So true. And those safety checks, I mean, those, those checkpoints are, you know, I, I think... Unfortunately, for a lot of people, that's not the instruction that people are given when they're, you know, prescribed these devices. It's it's almost, you know, I don't know if if people are actually instructed to also perform blood glucose testing, you know, and and knowing that knowing that you'd still be doing both of those, like Cyrus was describing, you know, he's using t- ultimately he's using two devices every single day now, and um, I'm not sure people would make the same decision about using a CGM if they know that it's going to require them to continue with a lot of blood glucose testing to verify the information that they're seeing. Yeah, you almost have to ask yourself, you're like, what's the point, like? 
if I'm using a CGM, part of the, the the allure and the draw of using it in the first place is that you don't have to check your blood glucose using a blood glucose meter all the time, right? Now, if you're using a Dexcom, you can calibrate the Dexcom using your blood glucose meter. So every once in a while, the Dexcom will prompt you and it'll say, time to calibrate. And then you go, okay, cool. Check your glucose meter. And then you're like, oh, my glucose meter says I'm at 114. Hey, Dexcom, I'm at 114. Enter. And it goes, cool. Thanks for the information. And then it uses that as part of its brain to make sure that the future readings are, are much more accurate. You can't do that with the Freestyle Libre, which I think is a huge design flaw, if you ask me. Right, because there's no feedback mechanism for me to be able to tell the app or the Dexcom. Se- I'm sorry, or the the Freestyle sensor whether or not it's doing a good job, right? And I think that's a, that's that's just a massive problem because if it never knows whether or not it's accurate, it's just going to assume it's going to operate under the assumption that it is accurate when in reality I can I can prove without any shadow of a doubt that it is not. <laughs> <laughs> 